seated. Take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 13. Your Bible or your app, however you read it, turn to Genesis chapter 13. Sharon is going to read the chapter for us today. So Abram left Egypt and traveled north into the Negev, along with his wife and Lot and all that they owned. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. From the Negev, they continued traveling by stages toward Bethel, and they pitched their tents between Bethel and Ai, where they had camped before. This was the same place where Abram had built the altar, and there he worshiped the Lord again. Lot, who was traveling with Abram, had also become very wealthy with flocks of sheep and goats and herds of cattle and many tents. But the land could not support both Abram and Lot with all of their flocks and herds living so close together. So disputes broke out between the herdsmen of Abram and Lot. At that time, Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land. Following, or finally, Abram said to Lot, let's Let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. After all, we are close relatives. The whole countryside is open to you. Take your choice of any section of the land you want, and we will separate. If you want the land on the left, then I'll take the land on the right. If you prefer the land on the right, then I'll take the land on the left. Lot took a long look at the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley in the direction of Zoar. The whole area was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord or the beautiful land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east of them. He went there with his flocks and servants and parted company with his uncle Abram. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan and Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. But the people of the area were extremely wicked and constantly sinning against the Lord. After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, Look, as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west, I am giving all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. And I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they cannot be counted. Go and walk through the land in every direction, for I am giving it to you. So Abram moved his camp to Hebron and settled near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. There he built another altar to the Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord for his word. I've spent most of my life in Indiana, as most of you know, and one of the largest, if not the largest, single-day sporting event in the world happens there, the Indianapolis 500. It took place just a couple of weeks ago. They call it the greatest spectacle in racing. The Indianapolis 500 was first run in 1911. The winner was Ray Haroon. He drove the 500 miles in 6 hours and 42 minutes and 8 seconds at an average speed of 74.6 miles per hour. Some of you go faster than that out on Highway 70 today. But in 2022, last year, Marcus Erickson made the 500 miles in two hours and 51 minutes at an average speed of 175.4 miles per hour. Now, the race does not always avoid controversy. In 1981, it appeared that Bobby Unser, of the famous Unser brothers, it appeared that Bobby Unser won his third Indy 500, and that's Bobby up there in the upper left he drove the car into Victory Lane, and he celebrated in the most unique way. The, the celebration in Victory Lane for the Indy 500 is more unique than anybody else. Decades ago, many, many decades ago, early in the history of the race, one of the guys who won happened to say in Victory Lane, boy, I could use a cold glass of buttermilk right now, and somebody ran and got him that for him. So every year since, the Indiana dairy farmers provide a bottle of milk 
and the winner gets a bottle of milk in Victory Lane. Now, usually they waste it by dousing it over their head. One time, Emerson Fittipaldi of Brazil, who owns orange groves in Brazil, got really mad because they brought, he got in trouble. They brought the milk. He sat, turned it away and said, no, I'd rather have orange juice. He had to drink the milk for the pictures the day after because he offended a whole lot of people by not drinking the milk. So Bobby Unser wins. He's in the upper left-hand corner there. He won in 1981. But Mario Andretti who's the other guy that you see in the pictures, Mario Andretti and some others thought that Bobby Unser made an illegal move coming out of the pit stop near the end of the race. And so even though Bobby Unser was declared the winner when the race was run and drank the milk and got the, all the victory celebration that takes place immediately after the race, judges watched the video over and over and over again overnight and they declared that Bobby Unser did make an illegal move, and they declared Mario Andretti the winner. And that's why even though Mario Andretti didn't get the wreath, and he didn't get the milk, and he didn't get the celebration in Victory Lane, the next day, he got his picture taken as the winner on what they call the Yard of Bricks. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway is called the Brick Yard, because back in 1911, when it was first built, the racetrack was made out of bricks. They have preserved that, at the start-finish line, there is three feet a yard of bricks that mark the start-finish line at the Indianapolis 500. So that's where all the pictures are taken. People get out of the car. They kiss the bricks. They do all kinds of crazy stuff. So, so Mario Andretti is now declared the winner. That would be his second win. He won first in 1969. And so Mario Andretti didn't get the victory lane celebration, but he got his picture taken on the yard of bricks. He got... He got the victor's ring. He got the ring for winning the race. But Bobby Unser wasn't satisfied with that. He took the situation to court. And it took from Memorial Day, the day of the race, to October. But Bobby Unser won in court. And so in October, months after the race was won, Bobby Unser was reinstated as the official winner of the 1981 Indianapolis 500, but Mario Andretti refused to give back the ring. So they made another ring for Unser as the champion. Poor Bobby Unser, he's dead and gone now. But Mario Andretti is still alive, and Mario Andretti still wears the champion's ring from the Indianapolis 500. Mario Andretti's grandson is now one of the racers that runs in the race. You know, this kind of stuff happens a lot. Conflict. Controversy. It's, it's, not, it's not a rare thing that happens in our lives. Some of you have probably faced conflict and controversy just this week. At your jobs, in your families, in the neighborhood, whatever. Who is the real winner? You get a holding pass or a pass interference call at the end of a Super Bowl game and it turns the entire game on that call and there's nothing but conflict and controversy or a cheap foul at the end of a basketball game. It makes the difference in the outcome. Should the penalty have even been called? Is the game fixed? Are the referees in the bag for one team? Who is the real winner? That's kind of like what's happening in the story that Sharon read for us here in Genesis chapter 13 between Abram and Lot. What's happening? Who's the real winner in this story? As we've been walking through Genesis to this point, we've been seeing that God wants us to be committed to community. And we've seen that a community is a group of people like us who hold some things in common unity. We either hold the area in which we live in common unity or we have a common interest or common hobbies, a common focus, common purpose, common family, common work, faith, life, community, common unity. And then the story of Noah and the flood, it's an encouragement to us to live a righteous life in the midst of our sinful culture. And the story in the Tower of Babel showed us that pride destroys, but purpose brings unity. And then last week we saw how Abram began to teach us about the power of influence and leadership. And he taught us that obedient faith is a powerful influence and trusting God's promises is a powerful influence. Sacrifice leads to greater influence and influencers are worshipers. So today from this story, the big idea is faithfulness leads to influence, which results in peacemaking. Faithfulness leads to influence, which will result in peace and peacemaking. Now let me show you something I believe is a key to this story. This conflict could have been avoided. I want to show you something that's a key to this story, and I believe it's a key for you and I following the Lord. 
Lot should not have even been there. You wouldn't have had the problem, you wouldn't have had the controversy if Lot wasn't there. Lot should not have been there. The whole thing could have been avoided. Family conflict would have been avoided if Abram had fully, fully obeyed what God said. And if Lot had not presumed upon the will of God, assuming that he knew the will of God without receiving clear direction. So let's go back one chapter back to Genesis chapter 12 and look at the call of Abram again. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, leave your relatives, leave your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make you famous. You'll be a blessing to others. I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed to you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Boo. That wasn't supposed to happen. That wasn't supposed to happen. Abram was told by God to leave the family behind. Now, Abram's just been called by God, okay? Abraham's not the the lifetime follower of God, walker with God, talker with God, has a great long history of following God. He is relatively new in his faith. He's very, very new in his relationship with God. But Abram was told to leave the family behind. Lot went with him. Interesting, the apostles in the New Testament didn't learn this lesson because Acts chapter 13 tells us that the apostles got together and the leaders of the church got together and they fasted and prayed for God's direction and the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so Paul and Barnabas launched out on their first missionary journey and Mark went with them. And then there's the big controversy halfway through that Mark quit. Mark quit on the missionary trip. He didn't stay, he left. And then, and then when Paul and Barnabas were getting ready for their second missionary trip, there was a big conflict. Barnabas said, we need to take Mark with us. And Paul said, no, he's a quitter, he won't last. He'll, he'll lag, he'll, he'll, he'll be a weight on us. We'll never be able to do what God wants to do because he quit. So Paul and Barnabas separated. So Paul took Silas, Barnabas took Mark. They went their separate ways. The controversy and the conflict wouldn't have happened if both Abram had listened to the voice of God, obeyed the voice of God, and if Paul and Barnabas and the leaders of the church would have listened to the voice of God. Mark wasn't supposed to go in the first place. Lot wasn't supposed to be here in the first place. When God gives us direction, we need to follow his direction. We need to do what he says. Not add to it, not take away from it. I'm just trying to make our lives better. It'll make our lives better. We need to follow the direction of the Lord to the letter. I don't really know enough about the 1981 Indianapolis 500 to know who should have won. But I can tell you this. Everyone involved thought they knew better than the authorities. Everyone involved thought they knew better than the race authorities. The decision as to who won was contested then and 42 years later. It's still a contested decision. When we do not fully and completely obey the direction of the Lord, it will lead to controversy and it will lead to conflict among us. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen because we're We're human. We're not always going to get it right. I don't condone that, but I acknowledge that. Even when we try our very best to understand God's plans completely, we will sometimes err. We'll make mistakes. We'll miss it. We think we heard something when we didn't. It was really our voice, not God's voice. This is why we got to press in. We've got to become closer and closer and closer to the Lord. We've got to open our lives to the Holy Spirit every day. We've got to know this word so we can know that when we feel he's speaking something to our lives, it lines up with the word. We don't want to move on our hopes and wishes. We've got to move by the direction of the Lord. Abram's considered the father of the faith, one of the most faithful people in the Bible, and he's called the friend of God. What did he do? What did he do in this conflict and what can we learn from it? First, positive influencers are peacemakers. Positive influences are peacemakers. Finally, Abram said to Lot, let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. Abram, take the initiative. Let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. After all, we are close relatives. And then Abram said, the whole countryside is open to you, Lot. Take your choice of any section of the land you want. We will separate. 
If you want the land to the left, then I'll take the land on the right. If you prefer the land on the right, then I'll go to the left. Now, we've already learned that Abram was willing to make sacrifices. Because everywhere Abram went, he built an altar. Everywhere he went, he built an altar. Everywhere he went, he offered a sacrifice to the Lord. Now he makes a different kind of sacrifice. Not just the sacrifice of an animal. Here's the deal. Lot was a problem. Lot was a problem, and Lot is going to continue to be a problem, as we will see as we continue to walk through Genesis. And Abram would have not have had these problems if he had fully, fully obeyed God in the first place. So here Lot takes the greener pastures, the story tells us. He leaves his older uncle, the one without whom he would have nothing. Lot would have nothing. Lot would not even be in this position. He leaves Abram with rocky, fruitless ground. Lot is looking out for himself and only himself. Lot is thinking about no one but himself. He's thinking, this is my chance, man. This is my opportunity. I'm going to grab for the good stuff. Who cares about Uncle Abram? He likely won't be around much longer anyway. Reminds me of a story that Jesus told about a young boy. We call it the prodigal son. The boy said, Dad, I wish you were dead. That's what he said when he said, I want my inheritance now. I want my money now. Dad, I wish you were dead. Just give me the money. The father of the prodigal son did what Abram did. Take it. Take it and go. See, that's the attitude that Lot had. I want it now. I want it now. What does Abram do to make peace? Abram makes a sacrifice. Just go ahead and take it. I don't want there to be problems. You see, peace is more important than prosperity. Peace is more important than prosperity. Abram said we're brothers. Listen, folks, we are brothers and sisters. Whenever conflicts or disagreements or differences of opinion arise among us, we need to remember that we are brothers and sisters first. We need to do everything we can to destroy gossip, destroy rumors, destroy any conversation that will cause division amongst us as brothers and sisters. And peacemaking will increase our influence. Peacemaking will increase our influence. Matthew 5, 9, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Proverbs 20, verse 3, avoiding a fight is a mark of honor. Only fools insist on quarreling. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. We need to decide that in obedience to the word of God, we are going to commit ourselves to the goal of only speaking well of other people. And when that's not possible, we will remain silent or we will privately go to that person. We will explain our goals. We will explain the offenses that would hinder us from speaking well of them. We will purpose to approach an offender in a spirit of genuine love, having first examined and corrected our own attitudes and actions only if we are unable to restore an offender will we share that problem with someone else with the goal of getting people back together in unity again. When we violate these goals, we purpose to ask forgiveness, knowing that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We need to work for peace. The Bible says make every effort, make every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's what Abraham's doing. That's what he's teaching us to do. So the sacrifices that Abram makes is an act of total faith, total trust. You just take whatever you want. God had already promised it to Abram, but Abram says, you take whatever you want. So the sacrifice, the sacrifice that Abram makes in this story is greater than the sacrifice of a single animal. He's trusting in the original promise of God. Go back again to Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. God said, I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make you famous. You'll be a blessing to others. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those. Curse those. Think of this. Curse those who treat you with contempt. Now Lot, the nephew, is treating his uncle with contempt. Abram didn't want a curse on Lot. Abram's wishing the best for Lot. That's why he's making the sacrifice. But he is trusting that his blessing, the blessing that God gave to Abraham, won't come by Abram looking out for himself. If God's promised you something, God will do it. You don't have to look out for yourself to get it done. 
God's blessing will come by trusting him, looking for peace, and working to maintain it. And ultimately, that gives us more influence in the world. If we are constantly griping and bickering and having trouble, whether it's here or whether it's out in the community, do you think anybody's going to want to follow our influence when we try to lead them to Jesus? So secondly, positive influencers and peacemakers are unselfishly generous. Positive influencers and peacemakers are unselfishly generous. You see, Abram gives no thought to himself. Now, we're talking about this story, and some of you have heard this story many, many times. For some of you, this may be the first time you've heard it or the first time you've heard it in a long, long time. But when we talk about these stories, we need to look at ourselves. We're not just looking at Abram and Lot today. We're asking ourselves, am I Abram or am I Lot? Is my attitude like Abram's in this story or is my attitude like Lot's in this story? Abram gave no thought to himself. Now, Abram might be remembering what happened in Egypt. Now, we went through a part of chapter 12 last week. We didn't go all the way to the end of chapter 12. So let's go back and review the end of chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, beginning to read with verse 10. This is before the situation with Lot. After God's promise, but before the situation with Lot in 13. At that time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abram to go down to Egypt. So he's gone where God's told him to go, but then there's a famine, so he has to go to Egypt to get food, and he lived as a foreigner. As he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abraham said to his wife, Sarah, Sarai, Sharon, (laughs) look, 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 you are a very beautiful woman, and everybody said amen. Amen. When the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, let's kill him. This is his wife. Let's kill him. Then we can have her. So tell him you're my sister. Tell him you're my sister. This is a great man of faith here, right? Tell him you're my sister. Still early in his life. Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. That's really stupid, but that's what he did. Isn't that stupid? They'll, they'll, they'll take you and do whatever they want to do with you, but you save my life and protect my life, okay? Sure enough, when Abram arrived in Egypt, everyone noticed Sarai's beauty, and when the palace officials saw her, they sang her praises to Pharaoh, their king, and Sarai was taken into the Pharaoh's palace. Then Pharaoh gave Abram many gifts because of her. Sheep and goats and cattle and male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camel. I've known throughout my, well, we've been married 34 years. I've known throughout all the years of ministry together. Most of the blessings I get is because the church really likes Sharon. I absolutely know for a fact. The church we pastored in Indianapolis, if I was single in Ohio, and then we were married when we pastored in Indianapolis. I know for a fact if she hadn't been with me in Indianapolis, people would have left the church. Absolutely. They did not like me, but they stayed in the church because of Sharon. Abram got all of these gifts. But the Lord sent terrible plagues upon Pharaoh and his household because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh summoned Abram and accused him sharply. What have you done to me, he demanded. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister and allow me to take her as my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and get out of here. Pharaoh ordered some of his men to escort them. (laughs) I imagine that was a pleasant day. Pharaoh ordered some of his men to escort them. That was the secret service and bodyguards. And he sent Abram out of the country along with his wife and all of his possessions. So what was Abram doing here? Abram, the hero of the story of Genesis 13, is the jerk in Genesis chapter 12. He was thinking of himself in Genesis chapter 12, just as Lot is doing in Genesis chapter 13. Abram had already been promised that God would take care of him and give him many descendants, but he is not trusting in the word of God yet. He wasn't fully trusting in God yet. He is still looking out for himself. He's not convinced at this point. He's not convinced that God is going to keep his word. He's not convinced that God is going to keep his promise without a little help from Abram. So we see the Abram of Genesis 13 is different than the Abram of Genesis 12. He's learned. He's grown. He's more trusting. He's got more faith. Listen, is is the person you are in 2023 going to be different than the person you were in 2022? Are you going to have greater faith? Are you going to have stronger faith? Are you going to have better ears to hear the word of God and do what he says? Abram's growing. He's more confident. He's more fully convinced in the word of God and he acts like it. 
when he gets to this story with Lot. And that makes him unselfishly generous. He's believing God. God's the one who made the promise. God's the one who's going to bless me. God's the one who's going to provide for me. So it doesn't matter. I can let Lot have whatever he wants. God's the one who's going to provide for me. And God had already told Abram that the land would belong to him. So he's already giving it away. He's already giving away what God told him he would have. At least he's given the land rights away. Genesis 13, verse 5, Lot, who was traveling with Abram, he had also become very wealthy because of his connection with Abram, with flocks of sheep and goats, herds of cattle, many tents. How did that happen? How did Lot get wealthy? Because he's traveling with a blessed man. That's how he got wealthy. The blessings of God upon Abram are overflowing onto Lot. Listen, it pays to hang around blessed people. Hang around blessed people. But if all we're going to do is get blessed due to somebody else's faithfulness and not our own faithfulness, the blessing will eventually run out. So, hang around blessed people and get blessed. But then get faith on top of the blessings so that you can get your blessings from your own faith and not just the overwash of somebody else. You see, Lot's the getter. Lot's the getter. And Abram is the giver. Stories always work out better for the giver. You've heard it said before, people say there are only two kinds of people in this world, the givers and the receivers. What did Jesus say? He said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. If all we ever do is receive, if we're always on the receiving end all the time, then we will always be in need. If you're always on the receiving and you've always got, you're always going to be in need. But when we give, even when we have little, when we give, we're going to be blessed. The way to get out of always being in need and always being the receiver is to start to give even what little you had. Paul wrote to the Corinthians about the Philippians. He said, let me tell you about the generosity of the Philippians. Though they were poor, out of their poverty, they gave. They gave generously. They asked us and asked us again for the privilege of giving. So Corinthians when I get to see you I want to see you give the way the Philippians gave it says specifically they gave out of their poverty they gave out of their lack they gave out of their need if you're always on the receiving end you always will be on the receiving end you got to take what little you have and you've got to start to give it away if you want to see God start to act and bless your life so here's a great attribute of Abram and positive influencers they learn from their experiences they learn from their experiences. They don't repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. They become peacemakers and extravagantly, unselfishly generous. Number three, God rewards sacrificial generosity. God rewards sacrificial generosity. What's going to happen to Lot? We're not going to get into it today, but we'll get into it as we keep walking through Genesis. Lot's going to end up in the city. Lot's not going to end up in that beautiful, beautiful fertile farmland and plain. He's going to end up in the city. He's going to have lots of trouble in the city. Was the grass really greener the direction Lot was going in? Didn't work out too well for him. You see, selfishness is the root of the original sin, and selfishness is the root of all sin. Selfishness is the root of all sin. I never really got into, uh, you know, some TV shows that get super popular. I never... I never get into them. I never did get into Seinfeld. I don't know if any of you ever watched Seinfeld or got into Seinfeld. Some people do. Some people didn't, you know. And uh, so Sharon, when she was gone up in Iowa and, and uh, take, helping take care of the kids and everything, I thought, I'm going to see what all the fuss was about 25 years ago. And so I watched about seven or eight Seinfeld episodes, you know. And uh, what I discovered was there's a bunch of single people always miserable. And the Kramer character, he's kind of the guy with the funny hair. He's, he's the funny one, really. But the rest of them, they're always miserable. Why are they always miserable? Why, why does every relationship they have break up? Because they're always looking for what the other person can give them. Whether it was a, hopefully a romantic relationship or just among friends or whatever. They are always look, and it's humorous to see people acting stupid. Yeah, that's humorous to see people acting stupid. I get why, and a lot of people could identify with it because most people are selfish, right? We're selfish. You're selfish. I'm selfish. We're all selfish. We want more. We want better. But their selfishness made them continuously miserable and never able to maintain healthy relationships. And so Lot is just acting out of complete and total selfishness and it doesn't work out well for him. 
But Abram's the one who gives generously and sacrificially, and look what he receives. Chapter 13, verses 14 through 18. After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, look as far as you can see, okay? You just gave that away to Lot there. Lot left you at this rocky, barren ground. But Abram, I want you to look as far as you can see in every direction, as far as you can see to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. I am going to give you all of it. I'm going to give you all of it as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession and I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth they can't be counted so go and walk through the land in every direction for I'm giving it to you so Abram moved his camp to Hebron and he settled near the oak grove belonging to Mamre and there what did he do he built another altar to the Lord sacrifice giving generosity it's constant in Abram's life Abram got it all by giving it all away Abram got it all by giving it all away. And what did he do again? He built another altar to the Lord. Abram just keeps giving and giving and giving and giving. And he kept sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing. And he kept getting blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. So the question for all of us today is, is am I Lot or am I Abram? Am I Lot or am I Abram? My default is Lot. If we're honest, that's for all of us. Our, our default position is Lot. The automatic first response is Lot. That's the natural. That's, that's the sin nature. I'm going to grab the fruit of the tree. I'm going to be like God. I'm going to get for myself all I can get for myself. That affects our marriages. What's she doing for me? What's she done for me lately? What, what You need to do more for me, Right? If we're always looking for the other person to do more for us, we're never going to be satisfied and we're never going to be content. You need to meet my needs. But con- conversely, we are always blessed when we put the other's needs above ourselves. We're always blessed when we put the other needs above ourselves. I'm not talking about being a doormat. I'm not talking about staying in an abusive situation. I'm talking about being a generous giver in all of our relationships. That's the heart and the attitude that is the opposite of the fall. That's what reverses the curse. That's what reverses the curse. And it leads to the blessings of God. And it will lead to greater influence. So faithfulness leads to influence. Which results in peacemaking and peace. You want peace? Here you go. Positive influencers or peacemakers. Be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. Positive influencers and peacemakers are unselfishly generous. Be generous, because God rewards sacrificial generosity. Sacrificial generosity. And we talked about it last week. It may look like a sacrifice to us, but in the end, it's never a sacrifice, because God's always got a bigger shovel than we do. He gives back more than we could ever give away. Let's stand to our feet, and I want us to think about our response to this message today. And the Holy Spirit has been here. And we've heard great testimonies of what happened at camp this past week by the moving of the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you what, the Holy, the Holy Spirit moves in response to our response. The Holy Spirit will come into our lives and He will make changes in our lives as we let Him, as we allow Him. He doesn't force His way onto us. He doesn't force change onto us. We have to open up. So let's respond to God's Word today. And, and first of all, Ask yourself, am I a peacemaker? Stop and think about that for a minute. Am I a peacemaker? Is there a situation that you're going through right now in which you can take steps to become a peacemaker? Maybe it's in your home. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's in the neighborhood. Maybe it's just among friends. Maybe it's here in the church. Am I a peacemaker? Or are there steps I need to take right now to be a peacemaker? Ask yourself this question. I think the Holy Spirit's asking us. Am I I living my life in an unselfishly generous way? Am I giving only the minimum requirement? Am I giving just the minimum that's asked of me? Or am I looking to how I can give more? 
I know the very first thing we think of is money, but there's so many other ways in which to give. Maybe money is the first thing that comes to our mind because that's the first thing the Holy Spirit is dealing with us on. So let's let him. Let's let him deal with us. Am I being unselfishly generous? And is there an opportunity before me right now where I can be unselfishly generous? Is there an opportunity before me right now where I can be unselfishly, unselfishly generous? And if not, where can I create that opportunity? <laughs> Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Where is there a place where I can, I can create an opportunity where I can become unselfishly generous? Third, am I hearing the voice of God and obeying it or am I doing like Abram did and taking Lot along with me inserting my own ideas and following well I'm not disobeying God Abraham Abraham didn't disobey God but he inserted something or he allowed something to happen in addition to that made him not fully obey because he was told to leave the family and Lot went with him Am I hearing the voice of God clearly? Am I obeying? Am I obeying completely, not just 90%? All of this, all of this flows from a relationship with Jesus Christ. So the final response today is, do I need to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ? Either for the first time or return to a real relationship. Not just, I prayed a prayer, my sins are forgiven, I'm going to heaven. But walking daily in a talking relationship with Jesus as our friend so I want us to begin to respond today if you're here and and you need to be a peacemaker if there's a situation today in which you can be and need to be a peacemaker we just want to pray with you we just want you to come forward and just open your life up to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit one of our prayer team members will just come along and lay a hand on your shoulder and just pray that God will bless what he's already doing in your life but I just invite you to come right now. Just come right now and stand or kneel at these altars if you need to be a peacemaker. There's a situation, circumstance in your life. You can begin today, you can begin this week to be a peacemaker. Just pause, let the Holy Spirit speak to us and respond to Him. situation I need to become a peacemaker second is there is there an opportunity before me right now where I can be unselfishly generous this goes against all of our natures folks now some of us have done it and gotten in the habit of doing it but 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 boy I'll tell you it still goes against our inner natural nature Right now, the Holy Spirit's saying, I want you to become an unselfishly generous person. And there's a situation right now in which you can begin to be generous. Or you can begin to create the opportunity to be generous. Just come. Holy Spirit's dealing with us to become unselfishly generous people. Thank you, Lord. Maybe you're the situation like Abram. You're obeying but not fully because Lot went along. Come. Come. If there's an area in your life the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now and you need to be more fully obedient, more fully obedient, totally obedient, not just partially, come. And if you need to give your life to Jesus, I want to invite you to come. And let's just all lift our hands to the Lord right now. As you're up here praying and receiving prayer team members with a hand on the shoulder, lift a hand towards heaven. Everybody in the congregation, let's just lift our hands towards heaven. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you for speaking to us today, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of this story, one of the first stories in the Bible. Lord, we want to be people who fully obey you. God, I pray that this church family would be a church family of people who fully obey completely obey 
not partially, not not taken along our own ideas with it, but fully and completely obeying. God, we thank you for the unity that exists in this church family. We thank you for the peace that is here. And we pray, God, that we would be a family full of peacemakers, that we would be a household of peacemakers. Lord, we pray that Camden First Assembly would be known in our community as a church family of unity and peace and making peace, Lord. We pray that everything in the past that's not of peace would be gone and that that we would have a reputation of Jesus and a reputation of Abram, Lord. We pray, God, that you would make us all sacrificially generous, Lord, unselfishly generous, God. Help us each one to realize, Lord, help us to realize what you want to do for us by us just saying, Lord, everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. Everything I own is yours, Lord. And you just, you just Ask me what you want me to do, God. Give us a chance, Lord. Give us an opportunity. Help us look for opportunities, God, to be unselfishly generous. And, Lord, we commit our lives to you. We ask you for forgiveness of our sins. And we ask, Lord, that you would come into our heart and life. And today, if you're making a commitment to the Lord for the first time or the first time in a long time, let us know on that card or let us know online if you're watching online that you're giving your life to Jesus. Let's just go back into worship in the Lord for a little bit. And if you want to come for any reason, if you want to come for prayer, if you want to worship around the altars, if you want to uh, just... uh, uh, just come for whatever reason to receive prayer. Just come. Let's just let this be a free time of letting the Holy Spirit come and work among us and live among us. Hallelujah. Sing it again. Spirit of the living God, let him come. Let the Spirit of the living God come. Hallelujah. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. We only want to hear your voice. Let's let him move today. Let him move in us before we leave today. Receive something from the Holy Spirit today. Receive something from the Holy Spirit today before you leave. More and more. Hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. We only want to hear your voice. Hanging on every Word, Spirit of Living God, Spirit of Living God, we want to know you more and more, hanging on every word. Oh, let's be open to Him. Let's be open to Him in this moment right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love and your goodness and the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we're leaning into all you are, everything else can wait. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, come now and breathe upon our hearts, come now and have your way, because when you speak, when you move or when you do what only you can do, it changes us, it changes what we see, what we see. When you come in the room, when you do what only you can do, it changes us, it changes what we see, what we see. Oh, come move among us, Lord. Come and move among us, Lord. Have your way in every life, Jesus. When you move, when you move, you move all our fears. When you move, you move us to tears. When you move, you move all our fears. When you move, you move us to tears. 
Lord, change what we see. Change what we seek, Lord. Oh, when you come in the room, oh, when you do what only you can do, it changes us. It changes what we see. What we see. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. If you need to go today, God bless you. Go in the power of the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit just continue to speak and move in your life throughout this week. May the blessing of God be on you. May the filling of the Spirit be with you. If you want to stick around here and just pray and seek and worship, we will. Let God do what God wants to do among us. If you need to go, God bless you. You can go if you want to stay and pray and seek and worship. Feel free to do that. Because when you speak and when you move, 